We know the joy of giving is its own reward. But who says you can't get something for yourself, too? Now when you buy vanilla Visa gift cards, you can enter to win one of over 10 prizes every week for 10 weeks, including a grand prize of $10,000 in vanilla gift cards. So get gifting and start sharing the delight for more chances to win. Go to get-gifting.com to learn more and enter for your chance to win. Cards are issued by the Bank Court Bank, Meta Bank, and Sutton Bank, members FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Inc., and may be used in the U.S. everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Terms and conditions apply. Cards distributed and serviced by Income Financial Services Inc., which is licensed as a money transmitter by the New York State Department of Financial Services. NMLS ID number 912772. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number 27. Beware of advice, even this. Carl Sandburg. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And the show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to to screenwriters, filmmakers, and content creators. It will be launching November 1st, and we'll have hundreds of hours of tutorials, interviews, documentaries, feature films, short films, educational courses, and just a mecca for everything screenwriting, filmmaking, and content creating. So for more information, head over to www.ifhtv.com. Today's episode is pretty amazing. It's all about story mapping and how you break down story and how you can model other successful stories to your own stories. And today's guest is author Dan Calvisi, and he wrote the book on story maps, literally. He has a book called Story Maps, How to Write a Great Screenplay. Then he also does dramas. He also breaks down Christopher Nolan's work. And Dan has read thousands of screenplays over the course of his career. He was a story analyst for a bunch of major studios like 20th Century Fox, Miramax, New Line Cinema, uh, and, and a bunch of stuff. He's got a lot of great content. And I wanted to bring him on the show to kind of go through this aspect of screenwriting and how you model other successful stories. And it's something I do all the time in every aspect of my my life uh, is model successful blueprints of other things that you're trying to achieve, whether that be podcasts, whether that be films, by watching other filmmakers make their films, and you can build upon what you've seen before to create your own unique product or film or service or whatever you're trying to do. It's invaluable for you to understand how to model successful blueprints. And Dan's uh, Story Maps is a really great starting point for that. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Dan Calvisi. I'd like to welcome to the show Dan Calvisi, man. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, man. So I wanted to first get into how did you get into this crazy business? Well, I went to NYU film school, and like everyone there, I wanted to be a writer-director, And but I really uh, got into screenwriting there. I really found that the screenplay was was really where my heart was, and I took a, um, a script analysis class that I really liked, so that was kind of the first time I ever really took apart like professional scripts, uh, their structure and everything we studied, you know, Sunset Boulevard and the Silence of the Lambs and really a wide swath of scripts and movies. So that really turned me on and I heard about this job of being a reader. So when I got out of college, I found my way to becoming a reader for various companies like Miramax mm-hmm. and Fox 2000. And I worked for Jonathan Demme's company, Clinic Aesthetico mm-hmm. and New Line and other things. So that was freelance reader work that I was doing. 
but I was working for enough companies where I was supporting myself and I learned on the job, you know, quickly I had to, cause they give you a bunch of scripts and you have to return them two days or maybe the next day, you know, maybe do an overnight job. Mm -hmm. So I had to do written analysis of all of these scripts and a lot of books as well. And so I really learned, uh, under fire and I started of course finding patterns and similarities in the bad scripts and the good scripts and seeing what worked and what didn't, especially uh, structure. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started to develop my story maps uh, structural method as well. So, so how do, so how does a young screenwriter uh, break into Hollywood as a script reader? Like what's that process like? Well, I think, these days, probably um, hone your craft a little bit, get your feet wet with contests, mm -hmm. um, with contests and film festivals. Mm -hmm. They probably won't pay you at first. So I would say do some free reader work, you know, um, reviewing the first round of submissions to, uh, you know, the Austin Screenwriting Conference or something like that mm -hmm. or the final draft contest. So contact them directly. Say you want to volunteer to be a reader. Hopefully they'll give you a test script to do uh, test notes on and confirm that you do know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Then from there, I would say it'll either be word of mouth. You'll hear about an opening or contact directly agencies, uh, management companies, production companies and studios. And if you contact enough and you send them in sample coverages, hopefully eventually um, there will be an opening and they will hire you for that. I got uh, my, one of my first jobs, the way I got into Miramax films was through their, uh, genre unit dimension films. This is, and then and, you got in at a time when Miramax was at the height of its powers. Yeah, they were absolutely at their peak. They were winning best picture. Um, and I, this was dimension films. They had the spy kids franchise, the screen franchise. Yeah, they were huge. Yeah, they were huge. And it was funny because I was told by a friend that he had been a reader there. He knew a guy there, but he said, don't call him because I know for a fact that they don't have any openings. Mm -hmm. And so I called him anyway, the guy at Dimension. And the first thing he said was, we have an opening for a reader. Do you want to test for it? <laughs> so the lesson there is be persistent. You know, somebody tells you not to do something. As long as you're not a jerk about it, go ahead and try and get your foot in the door. It doesn't hurt to make a phone call. That's one thing I always tell people is, you know, people still make phone calls in this town. Mm -hmm. So um, cold calling can work, you know. It's it's pretty remarkable, uh, you know, doing this show for so long. I, I cold I, I don't cold call. I cold tweet uh, or I cold email like I did to you. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's amazing. Uh, you know, you ask and people will like, yeah, sure. I'll come on. Yeah. Or sure, yeah. I'd like to have a meeting. Sure. It's it's mm -hmm. fascinating when you ask what happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what? Yeah, and I find one thing, it's hard to do, but if you can give them something, like a piece of information they may not have had, mm -hmm. or if you can stroke their ego, too, um, maybe in a unique way. Like, let's say you're contacting a company that makes a lot of big blockbuster movies, mm -hmm. but you're talking to an executive who happened to have made this really small indie film 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you tell them, hey, oh my gosh, I saw that film. I really loved it. You know, I'd love to learn more about it because you're, you know, you're kind of appealing to them, to their passion, you know, mm -hmm. not just their their latest superhero movie, which they may not have had anything to do with, you know? Yeah, that's something. And, and now with IMDb, you can literally do that research fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And do you agree that when you are reaching out to to gatekeepers or or people that you're trying to work with in one way, shape, or form, uh, providing value of some sort is a, or stro like you said, stroking the ego is one way uh, mm -hmm. in, but also providing some sort of value uh, in whatever that yeah. might be, whether that be free work, whether that be anything. Do you think that's a, a good rule of thumb? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. If you can offer them something, because because I mean, really, they get. If they're getting 20 scripts a day, they don't really need your script, you know, or your whatever you're trying to send to them. You know, they don't need to give you your break. So if you can somehow offer them something of value, you know, a piece of information or um, 
I don't know anything. Uh, maybe a, a bottle of their their favorite barbecue sauce from Brooklyn. You know, mm -hmm. if you do that kind of research, I guarantee you, if you do that kind of research and you hit up an executive, and that they you that you found the favorite barbecue sauce, and you're like, hey, I heard mm -hmm. this was your favorite. It could be a little creepy, but yet it could yeah. open the door. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, I also find um, if you if you see them talk on a panel. Mm -hmm. It helps to say, hey, I saw you talk on this panel and I really liked what you had to say, you know, and then given a specific example, because, mm -hmm. you know, people go to talk on panels because they want to be listened to, you know, mm -hmm. and they want to be adored and they want to, uh, you know, feel like they made a difference in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. So they may not have actually talked. Maybe they had to leave quickly so they didn't talk to anyone in the audience or maybe they were only approached by annoying people after their talk, you know? Oh, God, yes. So, you, <laughs> as we all know, there's there's always that person in the front row who just has the most inane questions, right? Oh, At any God. kind of Q&A. Like, yeah, like, um, how do you get $100 million to make my first feature? I'm like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you can show, you know, say something really smart and say, you know, you got some value out of their thing, then that sounds really nice to them. You know, they're glad that they did it. So what's the big difference between a script reader and a story analyst in, in regard, or are they the same thing in the studio system? They're the same thing in the studio system. Mm -hmm. um, outside the studio system, I would say uh, a story analyst is probably more of a consultant like me, a writing coach, mm -hmm. and also someone who feels comfortable analyzing any kind of narrative, whether it's a book, um, a movie, a TV show, or a video game, you know, or a myth or something like that. So that's something I, I like that term story analyst because it's kind of a universal thing saying I have years of experience analyzing narratives and, um, you know, taking apart the structural differences between, let's say, a fairy tale and a studio feature film, you know, so I analyze story. What are some of the common traits you see uh, since you've read so many, <clears throat> since you've read so many stories and screenplays, what are some mm -hmm. of the common traits you see of successful screenplays? Wow. Well, um, well, I always say you got to come right out of the gate and suck in the reader. So your opening has to be great. Um, open with something unique, ideally something we haven't seen before, or something that really endears us to your main characters. Um, they need to have really strong motivation that we identify with them and they have a really strong need. That's one thing that you just don't see enough in scripts and in movies as well. You mm -hmm. know, um, someone, an actor being a movie star is not enough anymore. To gain my, <laughs> yeah. And not just at the box office, just when you're watching a film to gain my interest in following them. If their character is a total jerk and just an immoral person, um, they still need a code of ethics that we believe in. They still, we still need to believe in their goal um, and root for them, you know? And so, so that can be tough to generate, that rooting interest in the reader or the audience. Can you give an example of a movie that did it right? Like th that opening, I mean, I'm thinking off the top of my head, like Shawshank or Die Hard or Lethal Weapon mm -hmm. or these kind of characters. Do you, do you know of a, 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 or can you come up with a movie that, has that kind of opening, like you really just fall in love with that character and that character, the leading character has that need? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, I mean, there's so many. Um, the classic example is Raiders of the Lost Ark. You mm -hmm. know, we see this guy do this amazing thing where he rescues this, uh, you know, golden idol from from this temple. And then it's and then it's taken from him by by this evil guy so we really we really uh you know feel for him and then he makes this dashing escape so um so and i think that 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 was necessary in that opening to have a uh, belloc the villain mm -hmm. you know so we don't just think okay this is just a random archaeologist who's just trying to get this golden idol because it's worth a lot of money you know you needed the villain to come in there and say hey you know i'm i'm the evil guy who who wants this for myself, you know, whereas you're, you're the pure one. Um, but trying to think of a more, uh, a more modern film, I would say, well, let's look at this summer. There was the, uh, Spider-Man homecoming, mm -hmm. you know, we do feel for Peter Parker because he's a kid mm -hmm. and he doesn't really know what he's doing. And he's struggling with, you know, kid stuff. Like he likes the pretty girl mm -hmm. and, 
Um, she won't give him the time of day, although she does kind of like him too much. That was one thing about it. I thought it was kind of too easy for him to get the girl. <laughs> she kind of already liked him. But um, so and that's something with like superhero movies. You still have to endear us to the character, especially even more because they have these superpowers. Right. So they could be just a superhero, not a regular person. But so in Spider-Man, he was a normal kid with normal problems. Yeah, I thought and that was yeah, really th- intentional on their part. I think they did a fant- I mean, out of all the Spider-Man movies, I think they nailed. And I do like the Tobey Maguire first and second one, but I felt that that in Spider-Man: Homecoming, they nailed the comic book Spider-Man. That mm-hmm. he was a kid with. Yeah. I mean, it literally yeah. almost turned into a John Hughes movie. <laughs> I mean, when you're watching it, you just feel like this really emotional attachment to his kid problems. Oh, and by the way, he's also fighting villains and, and dealing with mm-hmm. his form of puberty, which is uh, superpowers. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's not he's not that powerful yet. You know, he's still figuring out his superpowers and making mistakes. So Right, which was endearing. So, you, you know, he doesn't just come mm-hmm. out and he's perfect right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and especially with a character that we have such history with. I think they did a fantastic job, but that's a really good uh, – a really good example. Now, what are some of the common mistakes you see screenwriters make uh, again and again? Well, speaking of openings, you have the slow opening mm-hmm. um, that just doesn't suck in the reader. It starts with maybe too much exposition. That's one um, description that explains too much and it's too wordy. Those you know canyons of description, that black ink on the page, those mm-hmm. super big paragraphs. That's just death to a reader. You know, Mm -hmm. that's a reason why they're going to stop reading the description and start reading only the dialogue, which Mm -hmm. I always tried not to do. But it's your job as the screenwriter to make them want to read the description, Mm -hmm. you know, to come out of the gate because they're going to read everything. Let's say the first few pages, you know, there's that bleary eyed reader who's up at 4 a.m. and they've already read three scripts that day. And they're cracking your script and they don't, the last thing they want to do is read another script, right? So firstly, you don't want it to be 127 pages because they don't want to read that much. They're getting paid the same amount of money to read the 127 page script as they are to read the 95 page script. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep it lean and mean, that's great. Keep it in that 95 to 110 page range. Um, and then if you, uh, they're, so no matter the length, they're hopefully going to read at least the first two to five pages, you know, description and dialogue. Mm -hmm. So it's your job in those opening pages to have such great, lean, terse, descriptive description that really captures tone and mood and really makes them want to uh, enter this world and explore this world with your lead character and then endear us to their character. I hate to say it, but that save the cat moment. <laughs> Blake Snyder was brilliant in identifying that, you know, that moment where we really do connect with the main character and we really do um, root for them, that rooting interest. So if you can nail that in the opening pages, that's great. Um, that overall length is huge. Uh, having a really strong midpoint halfway through mm-hmm. that um, really ups the the stakes and the conflict and launches a new through line, unforeseen through line that's going to push to the end of the script, mm-hmm. you know, a disaster that we didn't see coming. Right. And then, of course, hitting all hitting all those those great signpost beats, you know, along the way. Right. And those are and that, that would, would leads me to my next question. What is the structure that professional screenwriters use as a general statement? Well, I call it the story map. And okay. it's my estimation is 95 percent of commercial movies use this structure because mm-hmm. um, pretty much 100 percent of movies that I study and I've studied a wide swath of them and read a lot of professional scripts use this structure. It's always in the same order. So I'm not you know, mixing and matching and placing beats all over the place. Mm -hmm. But to just mention the titles, excuse me, the titles of my beat sheet, my story maps beat sheet, it would be the opening, the inciting incident, strong movement forward, end of act one turn and decision, first trial, first casualty, midpoint, uh, declaration of war slash assumption of power, end of act two, turn and decision and it's important to end those acts on a turn and direction and a decision that propels us and the main character into the next act Mm 
Mm-hmm. And then now we're in act three and we have the true point of no return, the climax and the epilogue. And you want to end as soon after that climax as possible. So obviously there's a lot of, lot of characteristics that go with those beats, mm-hmm. but those are just the rough titles just to, you know, get you thinking in that direction. Now, and this, and this is a structure that you found that most professional scripts, about 95% of the scripts written in Hollywood use. Good ones. Yes. Professional good ones. And there, there are professional bad ones as well. So um, then, so, and I always like using this when I have, when I have a, a, a screenwriting uh, expert or, or story analyst on the show, I always like to bring up the, the, the script of Pulp Fiction and mm-hmm. what a genius uh, script it was. And a lot of people feel that that script was not in the conventional beats, but because the story was thrown all over the place, uh, out of order. Mm-hmm. But from my understanding, it did actually hit all those beats in a weird way. And that was the genius of that script. Do you agree with that? And what's your, what's your analysis of that script? Well, I haven't seen it in a long time. <laughs> right. I don't know. <clears throat> I'm guessing that it does hit every one of the beats. But the the overriding point to make is that even if a story is told nonlinear out of narrative order, it still should hit the beats, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, an example I know better would be Memento. Oh, God, um, yes. Because I, I broke down Memento um, in my book, Story Maps, the films of Christopher Nolan, because mm-hmm. I'm a- obsessed with Christopher Nolan. As you should be. And, as I should be, <laughs> yes. Um, and so in Memento, obviously, it's told in this crazy backward structure. It's not quite backward. It's, uh, it, you know, it has its own unique thing going on. It's kind of a horseshoe structure is, is what he called it. Mm-hmm. Um, but even though it's told backwards, quote backwards, it still hits all of those beats, you know, the inciting incident and the strong movement forward and the end of act one and all those things. Um, it's just the order that it's told, it hits those beats. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And that, that mm-hmm. movie is, I mean, if you're a young screenwriter, I mean, to watch, to try to break down or try to analyze that movie would, will, will screw with your head. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you should yeah, probably I think go. It, al- it, it almost killed us when we, when we were doing that. Um, it, it's, it's just such a, well, he's such an amazing filmmaker and screenwriter and storyteller that he's mm-hmm. on a different level playing field than the rest of us well he's you know he's saying uh, how can i make this different you know like he just he just had dunkirk this summer and Mm -hmm. instead of telling an absolutely straightforward historical epic biopic war film he said how can i make this different so he he did a triptych structure Mm -hmm. where he was telling the sea air and land story Mm-hmm. And he decided, for better or worse, that he was not going to give any real context to the battle. He was going to throw us into it and give us that, you know, ground level view of the grunt, the troop, the, the troops view of mm-hmm. the situation. So if they didn't know much, we didn't know much either. Mm-hmm. And he told it out of order. There was that moment where you realized it came together, where you realized that it was told slightly nonlinear, you know, because you had the... um the boat, the boat sequence was one day. Mm-hmm. The sequence on the beach with the mole mm-hmm. was one week. And then the aerial sequence with, with Tom Hardy in the planes was one hour. But they all did converge at a certain point. I think probably, no, no probably spo- no at spoilers. the 75 minute mark. Yeah, no spoilers. Yeah. No spoilers. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, but anyway, you, the, without any spoilers, it's you realize the true structure. Well into the film, you know what I mean. And, and since we're on, since we're on Christopher Nolan, I'm such a huge fan of his as well. What do you feel is his best screenplay and film? Wow! Um, if you had to pick one, that's really tough. Uh, it's tough. It would be between Memento, The Prestige, and I would have to say Inception over The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight's amazing, but he wrote and directed Inception, right? He wrote and directed Memento. All right. Um, wow. Inception is 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 it, it's such a unique film. It, it, yeah. It's it's yeah. it's basically the biggest budget uh, independent film. 
Oh, you think so? Yeah, because of the concept. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at the look what yeah. he's trying to do. It does take big, broad strokes. You need big. You need a big brush with that movie. You can't do that on an independent level. But to mm-hmm. tell that story inside of a studio system is is pretty remarkable. The last person I could even think of ever doing something like that would be Kubrick. You know, mm-hmm. and what he used to do constantly with every one of his movies inside the studio system. And I think uh, Nolan is one of those guys right now that is probably the closest thing to a Kubrick we have uh, mm-hmm. currently in cinema. Do you, Would you agree with that statement? I would say, well, I, I like to say he's our modern day Spielberg just because he works with big budgets. He mm-hmm. makes popular films with universal themes, mm-hmm. but with incredible directing and visuals, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's a little bit more, I guess, cerebral than Spielberg was in his, in his period when he was, you know, in his 40s as, as Christopher Nolan. So is. basically Kubrick and Spielberg had a kid and it's, it's Nolan. Yes, and it's Nolan. <laughs> exactly. And he's British and he always wears dashing clothing and he looks very dapper. Yes, he, he does. I actually, I actually met him once at, uh, in the back. Oh, wow. I met him in the back lot of uh, Warner Brothers and uh, he is, he's always got a suit on. He wow. has no phone, does not care to have – he's not on any – he doesn't have email. Yeah, that's crazy. He he does everything through his wife, who's his producing partner, and she, she's like, look, if something's important, it'll get to me. And that's wow. how, and he goes, I have, that way I have more time to work and more time to tell stories. I was like, wow, that's uh-huh. so amazing. But he's in a different – he's in a different world than the rest of us are, I think, in many mm-hmm. ways. Yeah. So – um. Back back to our interview. Uh, what is uh, the what's more important in your opinion, structure or character? Which is the ultimate question <laughs> in screenwriting. Wow. Or are they both combined the same? What, what do you think? Well, huh. It's funny. Well, the great structure doesn't really matter if we don't believe in and root for your character and want to follow them. You know. Right. So. I like to say character equals action because characters are defined by action. And then of course the structure is the form in which you put their actions into. It's not formula, it's form. Mm -hmm. It's the shape of the story. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I guess I would say if I had to say, I would say structure. If you're talking about unforeseen actions taken by characters surprise you know surprising us within the traditional classic structure um we don't want to be able to predict the beats you know we don't want to be able to predict predict the turns it has to still be surprising and that's good writing got it but you know character wow i I guess i mean you uh, can't you can't root for structure you root for character yeah yeah but I, if I really was pressed, I would say structure because that would mean an intriguing, surprising story that's compelling. You know, God, um, I, I, I probably feel that I would probably feel that they're both without the structure. You get you, you, you. I mean, can you have a movie with great characters and very loose, loosey goosey structure and still be successful? Yeah, I think you could. You know, if if we want to turn the page, if we if we just really want to follow these characters. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, Pulp Fiction is a good example. Pulp Fiction. If you really wanted to get nitty gritty, you could probably cut ten to twenty minutes from it, you mm-hmm. know, and still have the same story. It's definitely an art auteur film mm-hmm. that was made by a director who loved his dialogue and loved his characters and was willing to to spend time with them, you know, mm-hmm. to just sit and hang out with them. Um, but the editor in me and the script analyst in me <laughs> would like to cut time from that and pretty much cut time from almost every Tarantino film. <laughs> yes. Cause know. he does, he does talk a bit sometimes. He, he does enjoy, uh, you know, his, his dialogue and, and storytelling a little bit too much at sometimes, you know, I would, I would, I would agree with you as a critique of, of Tarantino. If there's anything, sometimes he just goes a little too far. And I think mm-hmm. he's gotten worse over the years, like hateful eight. I thought he really let that go a little too much in my opinion, mm-hmm. but, uh, but he's still, I mean, he's a once in a generation kind of filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah. He's still absolutely unique and, and, uh, you're not going to, see anyone who's like him you know i didn't see hateful eight i i was to the point where i'm to the point where i almost feel like i i I don't want to be tricked by him 
anymore <laughs> into watching, you know, ridiculously long um, dialogue scenes and overly violent scenes. You know, I, I just I think he he almost is gleeful in his violence and it, it goes past I got what you. it really needs to be, you know, but he's got millions of fans and they love him. So, yeah. So that's, and I'm looking forward to seeing his, his Chuck Manson film. That should be interesting. Yeah. Wow. That should be interesting. <laughs> so well, I see, I, I will say one thing about Tarantino, which is a good exa- which is a good lesson to screenwriters mm-hmm. is he, he usually makes movies about movies or st- straight genre films Mm -hmm. that don't necessarily give us a lot of insight into the human condition. Mm -hmm. And that's my main problem with his him is I don't really know what he cares about in the world. You know, I don't really know who Quentin Tarantino is. I don't really get universal themes from him other than making you know, like, let's say the Kill Bill movies, for example. I really mm-hmm. enjoy the Kill Bill movies, and they're really cool kung fu operas, mm-hmm. you know. But I'm not taking away much about the human condition. I'm not really that invested beyond uh, watching a cool revenge story. But I think, I, know? Think, I think that Tarantino, and this is just my humble opinion, I think yeah. Tarantino's point of view is that he his movies are a complete reflection of who he is, which is... That video store guy who loves movies yeah. and thinks yeah. of thinks of cinema as a religion. And he's not really interested in delving into the human condition. He's more interested in delving into cinema. And he yeah. is as pure of a cinema, cinematic uh, director as I've ever seen in, in the history of cinema. Because he, re- you're right, he does – all his films, you know, after you watch Django Unchained, there's really not a lot to discuss. A little bit maybe about the human condition. But generally, you know, Kill Bill, uh, Hateful Eight, these are all cinematic operas uh, yeah. about yeah. cinema or about the making of cinema. So I think that's – So are you saying – I mean are you saying – not in a bad way that he's a shallow person who only cares about movies because that's probably accurate, right? I mean, no, I think uh, look, I think his entire world um, revolves around cinema. I mean, everything mm-hmm. in his life is cinema has been for since he was a child and so ever since definitely since he was in the vi- in that video store. Me being a video store clerk for four years, uh, I feel him. Uh, I <laughs> and I understand I understand that completely, but I I think that that is his religion. That honestly, cinema is his religion. And whether it's shallow or not, it's his point of view. And it's such a unique point of view that there is literally no one else out there on the planet, on planet Earth that has Tarantino's perspective on anything. So it, whether it's shallow or not, that's that's opinion, but mm-hmm. that he really lives for cinema completely he will die with celluloid wrapped around him <laughs> and, but that's but that's who he is and that's what he mm. wants to do i mean he owns the beverly here theater that only shows 35 millimeter here in la he has an insane 35 millimeter print collection like who has i mean i know scorsese does but you know but like who has the the collection like his collection will be an archive Mm-hmm. Of, because there's movies that he has and nobody else has. I remember listening to a story that um, is, is it Wizza or I forgot who it was. I think it's Wizza from Wu Tang when he was uh, scoring Kill Bill. Told him, "Oh man, I got this kung fu movie. I just got it on VHS. It's super rare." He's like, "Yeah, that's nice. I got the 35 print." Wow. And he's like, "Whoa, okay, so I'm on a different playing field here." But that's who he is. So I, I think that I think about. I- and this is, I know this is, we're getting off in a No, tangent, no, go, for, no, let's go, 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 go. What if you had a painter who only painted referential works to other painters? At one point, wouldn't you want to say, well, what's, what's you, what is it about you that you want to put into these paintings? Or what are you saying really about the world? I, I, I agree or does with it you. not matter because there's already a million other painters that are doing that? Well, there, the, there's a difference between painting and cinema because cinema has so many more elements involved with just a painting. So if yeah, I had a painter that – I mean if you had a painter that just kept rehashing Annie Hall uh, – Annie, uh, Annie Hall, um, uh, Warhol and Basquiat and Van Gogh mm-hmm. and all these guys and just kept putting his th- – that wouldn't be as interesting. It might be for a little bit. It wouldn't be that interesting. 
but the wealth of cinema that there is and the the masters of the different masters of art that you need to to be master of uh, the different kind of art forms that you have to be a master of to be a, a filmmaker is uh, so so vast and deep that for someone mm. like him he could continue to make movies forever and never get boring because of that that de- and then he also has that knowledge i mean he has that encyclopedic knowledge of every movie he's ever seen it, you know okay well here's okay then here's my conclusion yes i want to see him do other genres I want to see him do a character drama. I want to see him a do comedy. I love to see a romantic character. comedy. Yes, you know. God, can you because imagine if he a truly Tarantino is romantic. if he truly is a student of all cinema, not mm-hmm. just action films, thrillers, mm-hmm. exploitation films. You know, I want to see him go on to try some really different things. You know, I would I think agree. That would be really fascinating. I would agree with you, and I think he has kind of. He has stuck to a little bit of, of of same genre films, and but he has in recent years kind of moved on. To, I mean, he did the western. He loved the western so much that he did uh, Hateful Eight, and you can argue Django obviously is a, is, is a form of western, but it's more black exploitation. So he is going to different genres within the genre world within his likes and dislikes. I'm really curious to see what he does with um, uh, the Manson murders like that. Mm-hmm is insane. I can't, I mean, and he wants Brad Pitt to play Manson. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, so I'm really curious to see where he goes, but that's the thing that how many filmmakers can you say, I'm curious to see what he does next. There's very yeah, few yeah. filmmakers out there like that in today's mm-hmm. world. And, uh, he's one of those guys. So, uh, I'm glad that we've gone on a complete Tarantino tangent, <laughs> but, uh, I think it's, so, I would say to bring it back to screenwriting, yes. um, a good thing that he does is he does focus mostly on genre films, you know? Yes. Um, the thriller, the action, kung fu, westerns. Exploitation. Um, at least for his exploitation, at least for his last, like, you know, three or four films. Mm-hmm. And for a screenwriter, if you're looking to break in by selling spec screenplays, it's good to focus on a genre. You know, you're the thriller guy, you're the, the horror guy, you're the romantic comedy uh, woman, you know, whoever, um, whatever your genre is, write five or six scripts in that genre. And maybe by the time you get to the fourth or fifth, you have something that's really, really ready for submission and could really uh, establish you and get your foot in the door, you know? So you do suggest that screenwriters stick within a genre at the beginning so they could be, because if you got a, a screen, mm-hmm. I know that's a, that's like the common mistake a lot of screenwriters make is in their they write five screenplays but they're a comedy a drama a horror a thriller to show range and mm-hmm. that's wonderful but that's very difficult for an agent to sell yeah 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 definitely it's, um i would say write you know be willing to write different genres to find yours that you're best at you know mm-hmm. but if you're if you come out of the box and like you love horror that's your passion and that's pretty much all that you want to write um it's okay to stick to horror, you know? Right. And, and be, and then eventually you either get locked into that horror or you move into something else, but at least you're in the, you in, you're in, you're in the business at this point, you're making yeah, a living. Yeah. And then if you want to go off and make something else, you can go off and make something else later. But like, yeah. you know, Sorkin and, and all these big uh, screenwriters that, you know, they were in one form, but then they started to branch out into, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like Charlie Kaufman, for God's sakes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you ever read, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've studied Charlie's work, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've definitely seen his films. And um, I th- I'm trying to think if I've read any of his scripts. The uh, the being- Just casually, I didn't read any on the job, but okay. I, I did, uh, you know, I have read them he's, on my own. He's pretty amazing. <laughs> he's a pretty, mm-hmm. pretty yeah. amazing screenwriter. Now, what is the difference between a protagonist in a film a feature film versus a television pilot hmm. well a feature film the big difference between a feature film and a tv show is that closed ending that a feature film has a closed ending mm-hmm. so it's that it's that beginning middle and end and it does end and it's a satisfying story unto itself whereas a tv pilot has to have some kind of open ending some kind of cliffhanger that makes you want to come back for more, you know, as far as the main character goes, I would say probably the, um, the TV main character has more emotional baggage, which may not be, we may not, and probably shouldn't see all of it in the pilot. 
Mm -hmm. So there's still stuff left to come that you can explore in the rest of season one and then season two, three and four, et cetera. Um, So there's going to be more complexity and emotional baggage that will come out over time. I would say a nice sense of mystery also about your main character really, um, really helps, you know, um, even if there's something that, you know, like, let's say in scandal, we know that she had a, we know that she had a, an affair with the president of the United States. He actually says that he's still in love with her, but we don't know the particulars. We don't know, well, how did they meet, you know, um, how far did their relationship go? Where are they at at this point? Did they break up at some point? Does the wife actually know? Does anyone else know? So we're just hinting at that. Mm-hmm. And that's a pretty fascinating thing to find out, okay, well, she had an affair with the president of the United States. He's still in love with her. Wow. I, I really want to tune in mm-hmm. to episode two and see, see what this is all about. And then in season one, they do explore when she was an intern at the White House and, um, or a new uh, new hire and, um, you know, how they actually develop their relationship. Um, now, so yeah, so there's kind of more of a sense of mystery, more to explore about them that makes us curious about them, but it doesn't give us everything. So then would you say, like one of my favorite television shows of all time is Breaking Bad, which mm-hmm. on paper is the worst pitch ever for a television show. <laughs> Uh, when well, heard. it's it's the best long term pitch. So. Re- yeah, long term pitch. The but Mr. Chips to Scarface, which, which is okay. Over time, yes. this is going to be a massive character arc, right? So, and so, can you kind of break down um, Walter White and how that? Because that pilot, honestly, uh, I was listening to Vince Gilligan uh, talk about it, and they said if you just change a few things, that's and release that at Sundance, it's probably one of the greatest independent films of all time <laughs> coming out because it was just be, yeah. so brilliantly done. It was so wonderfully mm-hmm. done. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about that or, or do you have enough knowledge about uh, Breaking Bad to, to discuss it a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I break down the pilot in my book, uh, okay. story maps, TV drama. So I have okay. a full beat sheet of that and okay. I'm, and I mention it a lot. Um, okay. so I'm definitely well versed on Breaking Bad. Um, so the, the famous pitch was, for the show was Mr. Chips to Scarface. So basic boring guy ends up becoming this incredible drug Lord who will kill at a moment's notice, you know? Um, And we begin with, he's a high school chemistry teacher. And one of the great things is that motivation that he has cancer. So, and, and the decision to keep it from his family at first, Right. Mm -hmm. And he needs money because he he has I think he had seven thousand dollars in the bank and he used all of that to buy this RV, which they're going to use to cook the meth in. (laughs) So we know he has no money. He has cancer. He needs money. He's a family man. He has a son who has is it cerebral palsy or something? Yes. Yes. Um, So I'm sure that that costs a lot of money. So he has a credible amount of motivation and to the outside world, he's the nicest guy in the world and the biggest just kind of wimp nebbish. Mm-hmm. And you say, wow, this guy's going to become Scarface. That's that's a journey I want to go on. Now, it's a risk because the executives say, well, wait, he doesn't get there for another three, four seasons. Mm-hmm. And he's not going to get fully into, you know, murderer mode until season five or six. Well, that's a big investment, you know. Um, so it took someone coming off of a couple of hit shows like Vince Gilligan mm-hmm. in order to sell that, you know, I don't know if a completely new writer who just has one pilot is going to be able to sell that pitch, but it's still a great pitch, you know? Right. Right. And, and it's, it took, it took a brave company. It took a brave studio to do mm-hmm. it. It took a very, and it took them a while to find the audience. It took them a little bit. It took them a couple seasons mm-hmm. before it started to, Pickups. I didn't pick. I didn't grab onto it till probably around season four. Wow. And season four is when I first like I'd heard about it. I'm like, let me just sit down and start watching. And then I binged it, and I actually got all the way to like half of season five, the last season left. And so wow. I watched the last five or six episodes like everybody else did. But I binged everything up until then. Mm-hmm. It was mm-hmm. such an amazing uh, and it's such, it's something to study because it's such mm-hmm. a remarkable footnote in in um in uh, television history, I think. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. For, for me, it was just the show that came on. Uh, it was either before or after. I think it was after Mad Men. <clears throat> Excuse me, because I was such a huge Mad Men fan. Mm-hmm. It was, oh, what, what's this show? And I, I just started watching it and got sucked into it, you know. And 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 but it doesn't work without Cradston. <laughs> that I mean, mm-hmm. he just was like amazing, <clears throat> amazing in that character. Now, what? Yeah, I- and right there, the casting. <clears throat> excuse me, one second. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the casting was perfect because they casted a guy who was previously known for playing a dorky dad. <laughs> yes, he did. You know. <laughs> yes. So we can't imagine him becoming this heartless murderer. You know. Right. That was the genius of the casting. They actually th- they actually said that Malcolm in the Middle was the um, I think it was the prequel to Breaking <laughs> Bad, and then that Breaking Bad was a bad dream that he wakes up <laughs> and he's like, "What? I thought I was a kingpin or something like that." And they actually <laughs> shot it. They actually shot that scene like that. That Bob Newhart. Uh, it was all oh, a dream. Really? The whole, the whole, the whole series was a dream. And he wakes up <laughs> in bed with his old wife from Malcolm in the middle. Like I had this dream. I was a drug kingpin and I killed people. He's like, just go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, can you tell me a little bit about story maps and what you're doing with story maps? Mm-hmm. Well, story maps is my structural method that I've written a number of books, um, about mm-hmm. and, uh, a story map itself is a really powerful outlining tool that breaks down your narrative into its most crucial basic dramatic elements. And then the, um, the four to six main story engines and the 10 to 15 major story beats, those signpost beats in Mm -hmm. your plot. Mm -hmm. And you can use the story map to construct a new story, a new screenplay, TV pilot, or even, even a novel or short story Mm -hmm. and you can use it to deconstruct an existing narrative like you know your favorite movie or a bunch of movies from your genre of choice to see how they were done by those professionals or a bunch of tv pilots to help you learn how to write a tv pilot Um, the great thing that i always suggest and people say Okay, so structure is so important. Form is so important. Again, it's form, form, not formula. It doesn't dictate your choices. It just um, gives you a shape and a form to put your choices into that's based on uh, years and years of successful structure of films and TV. Excuse me. Wow. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Um, And so you can not only deconstruct your favorite films and stuff, but you can use them as structural templates. So let's say you want to write a crime genre, crime drama pilot, and you want your main character is going to be a guy from quote, the normal world. Mm -hmm. You could use the breaking bad pilot as your structural template. So you start with breaking it down into a story map, or you get my book story maps, TV drama, the structure Mm -hmm. of the one hour television pilot. Mm-hmm. And you look at that beat sheet for Breaking Bad and you use that as a template to write your own script, at least the first draft. And then you can deviate from that as your story um, demands and allows, you know. So it's a good starting point. It's a great starting point. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a big I'm a big a, a big proponent of of structure because I feel it, it's like a roadmap for you to kind of like start tossing your characters into and start moving them around. Yeah. And it just gives you you know, uh, posts along the way of your journey it makes mm-hmm. life a little easier. Yeah. And being, and having come from the world of being a reader on the job for, for studios and production companies and, and, you know, professional companies, I was looking for those structural signposts. You know, mm-hmm. I was looking for an act one that was around 30 pages. Now, mm-hmm. A lot of act ones end exactly on 30 pages and that's great. And I would give them a standing ovation for that. And that would make me feel really great because that was familiar, but it could end on page 29 or 28 or 31 or 32. Mm -hmm. And that would be okay. You know, Mm -hmm. as long as it was working in, in every other way. Um, so it doesn't have to exactly be, um, you know, a 30 page act one, but Mm -hmm. you want to have those story beats in there that are the classic story beats that are in 95% of movies. And the thing is that the reader is looking for that. So if you have a 47 page act one, then that reader is going to know 
their red flag is going to go up and they're going to say, okay, maybe this person doesn't understand structure. Maybe they are overwriting because they're in love with their, with their words, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's when, that's when story maps or structural, uh, guy kind of helps you along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you can look at these other examples from so many other films and you can map out your own favorite films and say, okay, well they had a, they had an exactly 30 minute act one. Well, there must be something there. You know, if, if Christopher Nolan and Steven Spielberg and, and Darren Aronofsky had an exact 30 minute act one and every one of them was working in a different genre, there must be something about that 30 minute or 30 page act one. So maybe I should stick within that structure. Mm -hmm. you know? And then once you get three or four or five or 10 or 20 screenplays and you want to start playing around with structure and making mm -hmm. it a little bit more artistic, that's, that's up to your provocative. But I think you need to learn the rules before you break them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even, and in mapping popular films and scripts, um, you do find little anomalies and things that are interesting. Like I just mapped, uh, La La Land. I, I mm -hmm. gave that out as a freebie to my newsletter subscribers. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you want to sign up for that, it's on, it's at act for screenplays.com. I'll put it in the show notes. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, I mapped out La La Land and I originally had the turn, the end of act one turn coming right at 30 minutes. Cause that, that 30 minute arc is when they're at the party and she, she's mocked him cause she sees him in the eighties, the eighties cover band. Right. And he had previously always thought he was such a serious musician and she sees him in this cheesy eighties cover band and he confronts her, they argue and he says, all right, I'll see you in the movies. And he stalks off and that's like exactly 30 minutes. And so I thought, okay, well that's the end of act one, but I ended up changing the end of act one to 25 minutes. And I'm trying to remember what was the moment. Um, I don't quite remember what the moment was, but it was, um, it was an earlier moment, which I felt really capped off act one. It was them. Oh, it was the moment when she, we, we see, we finally realized the fruition of what she was looking at when she heard that enchanting, uh, jazz music, piano music. And she comes into the club and we originally had just seen her eyes looking off camera, you know, really entranced. And then we cut away. So now we come back 10 minutes later and we see what she was looking at and it's him at the piano. So it's that big moment where um, they already had their quote, meet cute, which was her flipping him off, you know, on, right. in, in the, the traffic. And lovely um, LA traffic, yes. Yeah, yeah, but, um, but this was really the fruition of them, the first moment of them romantically coming together. So I said, you know what? This was a 25 minute act one, um, which may not sound like that big of a deal, but, mm -hmm. When 90, 95% of act ones are around 30 minutes mm -hmm. to change that by five minutes, it can actually kind of be a big deal sometimes. Depending on the story. Mm -hmm. Depending on the story. So now I'm going to talk, ask you a, a couple questions. I ask all of my, uh, all of my guests. So uh, what okay. advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business? Okay. Um, does it have to be one piece of advice? You can give or? two or three. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, read as many scripts as possible that you can get your hands on. Um, you can download a lot of them online. You probably have friends that can send you the PDFs. Mm -hmm. Read as many scripts as possible, professional scripts, and break down or story map as many films as possible to really see how the professionals do it. You know, use those as templates. Don't just watch movies and think about them. Do written analysis of the movies, even do your own coverage reports, you know, do a, do a page or two of actual notes, um, commentary, critique of an actual film. Um, and maybe you want to take that professionally and become a reader, you know, but do written analysis, whether it's a beat sheet or your own little essay about a film, because it forces you to really take it apart. You know, to really think about that. Okay, where is the end of Act One? Is it 25 minutes or is it 30 minutes? Um, and if you force yourself to decide on that and map it out, then you're really going to see how how these things work and really take them apart and see how they run. Perfect. Now, can you tell me 
Uh, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Besides story maps, of course. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I have to go back to Sid Field's screenplay because yeah. I got that. I can't remember. I think it was my senior year of high school, actually. Yeah. Um, I think my mom found it or something. And uh, and that just was my the first time I even learned about feature film screenplay structure, you know, so that just really blew the doors open for me. Same here. When I read that book in college, I was just, my mind was blown. I'm like, what? Every movie is the same? What? It just, Mm -hmm. it it kind of blew my mind as well. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Wow. Um, Well, it's funny. I will say, something that I'm learning now is I'm pursuing more the independent route, um, Mm -hmm. with my own scripts and pilots. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm working with friends to ideally produce my own work. You know, we're Mm -hmm. still in the development stage, but because it is really hard to, if you only have a script to convince that studio production company, network, uh, agency, whatever, to take a chance on you because it's just a script, you know, you don't have, actors attached you don't have financing behind you you don't have a director attached audience Um, an audience built up anything an audience built up a track record so i think i'm coming to the point where i'm just like you know what got to do it yourself you know um and i've been getting that note for the past 10 years Mm -hmm. even more you know especially with the dawn of youtube Mm -hmm. and all these streaming streaming services Mm mm-hmm Everyone keeps saying, do it yourself, do it yourself. You know, you, you can get your hands on a camera that's, that's cinema quality. If, if an iPhone can shoot a movie now, anybody can shoot a movie, you know. Now, the problem with that is anybody can shoot a bad movie that's unprofessional and never sells. You know? Yes. And maybe goes to 10 film festivals and you have to pay to travel to 10 film festivals. And before you're done, you're $20,000 in debt. But, you know, let's look on the bright side and say, you're going to make a good movie, you know, that is going to go somewhere, or it's just going to become your, your sizzle reel or resume to get you a good manager and a good agent and really get you moving. But I would say, um, it's the do it yourself thing, you know, um, a script, a single great, awesome script should be enough. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it's so competitive that it isn't always enough. I mean, the black, but, the blacklist is a good example of that. How many amazing uh-huh. scripts are on the blacklist and it's still hard. Yeah. It's still hard for them to get produced, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but the only thing that you ha- the only thing you need, the requirement you need to start is a great script. Okay. So if you're <laughs> going to produce it yourself for $10,000 and shoot it with your iPhone, you still need a great script. If you're going to sell it to Warner Brothers for $100,000, you still need a great script. You know, if you're going to attach an indie producer who has a track record who won Sundance, you still need a great script. And that means you're going to have to spend years developing your craft, you know. Mm -hmm. Well said, sir. Well said. Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Well, uh, that's interesting because I have – I always say – my two favorite, I can't choose which is my, I can't choose which is my number one favorite film. Mm -hmm. So I actually have three favorite films. They are Raiders of the Lost Ark, Goodfellas, and The Wizard of Oz. Great combo. They're incredibly different films. I mean, you can't get any more different. (laughs) You think? (laughs) But, uh, but they're so different, you know, I mean, they're so amazing that those are kind of my top three spots. And depending on how I'm feeling at the moment, one of them may be number one or they may all three be number one, but yeah, got it. They're amazing. Now, where can people find you and your work? Well, you can find me at act for screenplays.com. That's mm-hmm. my homepage. And that is a C T F O U R screenplays.com. And you can learn about my consulting and you can get my books and you can get a lot of, um, free advice and downloads and things like that. Um, you can also sign up for my newsletter there and I give out, um, exclusive articles, sometimes leads from producers 
and sometimes free story maps through my newsletter. Mm -hmm. So um, you can learn about that. You can also learn about my story maps masterclass, which is an eight week program. It begins with an eight week program where you develop a TV pilot or a feature mm -hmm. from the ground up from concept and log line straight through to a finished draft. Mm -hmm. Uh, you probably won't finish the eight weeks with a finished draft, but you'll definitely be on your way. You'll probably finish with a rock solid story map, a great scene list, you know, comprehensive scene list and the first 10 to 30 pages of your screenplay. So then from there, you're armed to. to you're well on your way to creating a great script. And what's unique about my masterclass is that I bring in to actually give advice on your log lines and to actually do Q&A conference calls with my writers to give them career advice as well. That's awesome. So let's say you're workshopping two log lines. You're not sure which one you're going to write. I'm going to give you notes. Um, if it's a group class, your peers will give you notes. And then these two industry professionals, like right now I have a former studio executive who was at the studio level. He was involved with films like Groundhog Day, Great movie. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, you know, so he was a really top uh, like president of marketing at big companies like New Line and MGM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I have um, a very successful screenwriter, uh, Jeffrey Reddick, who is responsible for the Final Destination franchise. He's big mm -hmm. in thrillers and horror. So these guys are going to give notes on concepts uh, from my writers for my next uh, for my next class. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So you get this feedback from these people who are executives, managers, assistants to agents, screenwriters. They've been in the business for a long time and they say, you know what, this first log line sounds interesting, but this is more of a passion piece. This is not something that in the current marketplace from a newbie is really going to go anywhere. But the second log line feels more commercial to me, although you maybe don't have all the elements worked out yet. So then you have this information and you're going to decide whether you want to go with the first concept for the second concept. Very cool. Very so it cool. really helps. Well, Dan, man, thank you so much for being on the show. I, you've, you've dropped a bunch of knowledge bombs on uh, the Indie Film Hustle tribe, so I truly appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. My goal was to drop knowledge bombs. <laughs> and you did, Hopefully sir. Thank that you. Was, that was achieved. <laughs> I want to thank Dan for coming on and dropping those knowledge bombs on us. And I hope you guys got something out of it. You know, after he's been reading just thousands of screenplays over the course of his career, I think he has a decent grasp on story. And if you guys want to check out his books, just head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS 027 for all the links to all of his work. And that does it for another episode. So as always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y.com. We know the joy of giving is its own reward. But who says you can't get something for yourself, too? Now when you buy vanilla Visa gift cards, you can enter to win one of over 10 prizes every week for 10 weeks including a grand prize of $10,000 in vanilla gift cards. So get gifting and start sharing the delight for more chances to win. Go to get-gifting.com to learn more and enter for your chance to win. Cards are issued by the Bank Court Bank, MetaBank, and Sutton Bank, members FDIC, pursuant to a license from Visa USA, Inc., and may be used in the U.S. everywhere Visa debit cards are accepted. Terms and conditions apply. Cards distributed and serviced by Income Financial Services, Inc., which is licensed as a money transmitter by the New York State Department of Financial Services. NMLS ID number 912772. Time to put up the tree. Nothing goes by faster than the holidays. Time for family photos. Time to cut the turkey. Time to take down the tree. Actually, the Lexus December to Remember sales event also goes by fast, featuring extraordinary offers that are most popular models. Lease the 2020 RX 350 all-wheel drive for $4.19 a month for 27 months with $34.99 to its signing. Experience amazing at your New York, New Jersey, Connecticut Lexus dealer. Call 1-800-USA-LEXUS for important lease offer and pricing details. Not all customers will qualify. Offer valid in the Lexus Eastern area only and ends December 2nd, 2019.